Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 through 19. By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, Through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. Faith is the victory. You'll notice the last line of that is, faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And I'm so thankful for that reminder this morning, and I I thought of the flip side to that. The world is overcome by sin. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, we need the victory to help us overcome sin. And that victory is found in Christ. And I tell you, we got, a, a, we got to see a piece of that, that victory yesterday as we were striving to bring the message of salvation and, and, and just being able to have conversations with our neighbors yesterday as we, we gathered together here and we, we went out and, uh, in pairs. And it was, it, it was an encouragement because we were also telling people about the things that we're doing, the events that we're taking part in and our trunk or treat and also our, our pizza with Santa and things like that. We also had just some information for you know concerning the church. And, and because of that, we had opportunities to have conversations with, with, with our neighbors. But we also got to, in some ways, in some instances, direct that conversation to God. In one situation, uh, Frank Montgomery and, and me, we were, we were with Michelle, and we, we were able to, to discuss with her. She shared some, some struggles that she'd had. And we were literally able to pray to God, and, and we just gathered in a circle and just prayed right there in front of her house and that was something Frank said. He said, later on, we were walking back. He said, that is why we're here. Because faith is the victory. And uh, d- th- the idea is we're sim- simply trying to plant and water. And it reminds me of what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, 6. He said, Paul planted, Apollos watered, but God provides the increase. Neither he who plants or he who waters is anything but God who gives the growth. God will provide. And that's the focus of our lesson this morning. The Lord will provide And this is based on the last two weeks as we have been very prayerful in our discussion here for these moments. We've uh, we've discussed fasting two weeks ago and then we've discussed the process of prayer last week. And if just briefly, just a summary of that is in fasting, you literally, you're emptying yourself of the distraction. You're emptying yourself of the things that you feel you depend upon in those moments so that you can literally approach the throne of God and empty yourself in pouring out your heart to God. And sometimes we don't even know where to begin, but we saw in Romans chapter 8 that we receive groanings that are too deep for words, verse 26 and 27, from the Holy Spirit. that literally helps us to pour our heart out to God in all of our cares and our worries and concerns in those supplications. But then... We understand from Ephesians 3, 1 that we receive a fullness from God in the process of prayer that goes beyond our comprehension. So it's the very process of prayer that helps us in a relationship with God. But I think so often we go to prayer or we approach prayer with this idea that, well, I have a need. And therefore, as I'm approaching God with this need, I, you know, really the it's a means to an end that I have to ask. And so we really want to get that done with so that we can really get what, what, we're, what we're after, the getting part. And so what, what, is, what we're seeing is it's the process of prayer that helps us in a relationship with God. And if we have that mentality, we're missing out on the fact that the Lord is our provider. He is our Father, and He provides. So the focus we're going to have is that, that part of His, what's in His wheelhouse, the Lord's providence. And really, he has provided with uh, for us two situations that are linked. Uh, as was read for us, at Canaan read for us in Hebrews chapter 11, we see the faith of Abraham, that he was called by God to leave Ur of the Chaldeans and go to a place that he would be told in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. And so we're going to see where he is, he is told to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice, his own, the only begotten son of his wife and he. 
And that's going to compare to Jesus as he was approaching the throne of God and saying, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not my will, but your will be done. That God, our Father, was going to give his only begotten Son, but for yours and my sin. And there's an obvious link for the two. But in pre- pre- preparation for this lesson, I found links I'd never seen before, and I'm looking forward to them this morning. And so we're allowing that to provide us with our points on the Lord will provide. In the first place, a test. There's a secondary application of this that will, it will help us, but I, I want us to look specifically at where the Hebrews writer was talking in Genesis 21, where Abraham is first called to offer his son. In verse 33... It says, Abraham planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of the Lord, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned many days in the land of the Philistines. Now, as it's interesting, as you're going through Scripture, there's going to be things, places, items that are mentioned, like a tamarisk tree, Beersheba, that are very specific. They're there for a reason, but so often I read those to get to the good part, and we skip over them. But what's interesting is I, I looked into the idea of a tamarisk tree. What is a tamarisk tree? This is a picture of a, of a very much matured tamarisk tree in Palestine. And this is something that he planted. So it did not look like this at this moment. But where he planted the tamarisk tree, it says, There he called upon the name of the Lord. As we said before in Genesis 12:1, Abraham was called by God to go to a place that he would tell him. And he ends up in a place called Beersheba, and he sets up a place where he calls on the name of the Lord. He's setting up his place of worship. And what's interesting about a tamarisk tree, I want you to think about Palestine. It's very similar to our climate here in the south. And so when you're outside, you're exposed in the elements, in the heat. It's very challenging for you to spend a long time in prayer to God in the elements. And so they would pray under a tamarisk tree. We also understand this in John chapter 1 when Nathaniel was called by Jesus and became one of the apostles. He said, I saw you when you were under the fig tree. A fig tree was very similar. They would go inside the fig tree. It created a canopy for their worship. And so I believe this is pointing out that he is setting up a place where he's wanting to worship God. He's been told that he's going to go to a place that God has told him. And here he camps out. He sojourned many days. But look at verse 1 of chapter 22. It says, After these things, so after the planting of the tamarisk tree, after his calling on the name of the Lord, it said, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. So it's flipped. Abraham calls on the name of the Lord. Now God calls on the name of Abraham. And he said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Of which I shall tell you is very similar to go to the land of which I will show you. And so he's saying it's, this is not the place for where, I, where I'm going to show you. He's pointing to something very specific. And he was in Beersheba where the tamarisk tree was there in the bottom left corner. And he's supposed to go to Mount Moriah. And that's 45 miles. And in fact, on the main slide, there's this little squiggly line that is the orange line. And it is believed to be the exact path that Abraham would have taken to get from Beersheba. And if you look on the map, you see the topography It's uh, in the other slide. It's mountainous, it's, it's a challenging journey, 45 miles. We know it was a three days journey. You know, God, I just worshipped you right here next to this tamarisk tree. That would be a whole lot easier if I could just stay right here. A three days journey. Now, I don't think we can usually get our mind around what a three days journey would be. I mean, that would be getting all the way to the west, getting in our car, but especially 45 miles taking three days, unless you've driven through Atlanta. Maybe you can understand that, you know. But the idea of a 45-mile journey to get to the place that God is calling him is extremely important because God is calling him to worship him according to what he wants, not according to what Abraham wants. And we need to realize that for us, when we go to serve and worship God, that is, there's a journey that God is calling us to, and it's not about what we plant, 
It's not about what we water. It's about God who provides the increase. And neither he who plants or he waters is anything but God who gives the growth. And God has given us the direction that he wants us to get to him. And so notice, because he's called on the name of the Lord, he receives a test as a result. It's going to be a test just to get to the place that God wants for your life and my life. It's not an easy path. In fact, James chapter 1 and verse 2 would show us this. We're told to count it all joy, my brothers, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, and let patience have its perfect work, that you may be complete, lacking nothing. So may it have its perfect work, is it, may, may it take full effect your, your faith is going to be tested, and the, te- the, the faith of Abraham was tested. We saw that in Hebrews chapter 11. We'll look at that in just a moment. But I want to camp out here for, for just this time and see that there's a process God is giving us so that we will be complete, lacking nothing. God wants you to lack nothing, and I'm not talking about a prosperity gospel concept because of verse 5, we understand Verse 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom. So he's just said there's a process by which you can lack nothing when it comes to your faith. So that doesn't mean that you'll lack nothing when it comes to your stuff. He's referring to lacking nothing concerning your faith. And your faith will be tested. There will be trials that are there so that you will be complete lacking nothing. But he says, if you lack wisdom, let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach it will be given In verses 2 through 4, he gives the process by which you'll lack nothing. So if you lack wisdom, you'll gain the opportunity to have wisdom. It's a test. And so notice the moment we pray to God, the moment Abraham prayed to God, he received a test. When we pray to God, this describes a test. And this is a process that will keep us going until Jesus returns. In fact, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. And so that test is there, and it was there for Abraham so that we can glean from how to stay strong ourselves. In verse 17 of Hebrews 11, I want to read it again. It says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. He considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, from which, figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. So the fact that he said that Isaac is here and he was 100 years old when he was born, it was a miracle that brought him into the world. And he believed that he could bring him back from the dead if he even offered him. Because he believed the words of Jesus that through his line, all the earth would be blessed. And so it was considered to him as faithful. He was given a test. The Lord will provide a test, but he'll also provide a lamb. And so what we're doing is we're going back to Genesis. If you want to put a bookmark there, I should have told you this. We're just going through this account of him, of him offering his son, and we're bringing points from that, and we're gleaning from there. Verse 3 of Genesis 22, where we left off here, says, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. So, again... That's a 45-mile journey. Notice it's on a donkey. And because of the topography, we know that it was mountainous. I I mean, can you imagine having to go to these lengths to get to the place for worship? We know that it was considered worship because of what Isaac says. But look at verse 4. It says, On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. So that's how we know it was a three-day's journey, and he still hadn't gotten to the place that God told him. It says, then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. So they went on foot. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took it in his hand, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went both of them together. But something's missing. 
Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? So he knows that they're going to this specific place to worship. And he's saying, Where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Look at verse 8. Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. So what's interesting to me is Abraham, I don't believe, understands what he's saying completely like you and me know. Because he did provide a lamb. He's saying he's going to provide a sacrifice. He's literally providing based on Hebrews chapter 11. So hear me out here. He believed that he was going to provide for the sacrifice even though his son would die. He would be risen from the dead. Hebrews 11 brings that out. But he doesn't understand the lamb that would be provided for the children of Israel who would come through the line of Isaac after 430 years of slavery. In Exodus chapter 12 and verse 1, God heard the prayers of the children of Israel. And he's already given nine plagues to that effect to show that the God of creation is stronger than all the gods that the Egyptians were serving. From the Nile that was turned to blood because they worshipped the Nile to the frogs that came up out of it, they worshipped the frogs. He showed that he was the God of creation through this destruction of all of their so-called little G gods. And he brings it to the tenth plague, the death of the firstborn. You see, the Pharaoh believed that he was a god himself, and if the Pharaoh, the next in line, could die just like those in the, the smallest, in the, the, the lowest household, then that meant that he was just a man. He was not a god. And the god of creation was God. But God provided a way for the firstborn not to die through a lamb that had to die. Exodus 12 and verse 1 says, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be for you the month of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. He's saying, after 430 years, this month that you're experiencing, this is your new January. This is a, this is a brand new start to your life. This is a complete life changer. Tell all the congregation of Israel that on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make your, your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male a year old. You, make, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. So it's important to recognize that, that he's saying that a lamb would be provided for the children of Israel so that their firstborn did not have to die. And it's interesting that Abraham said the very same thing. The Lord will provide a lamb so that his firstborn didn't have to die. And that took place. But he also provided a place. Genesis 22 and verse 9, beginning... Back where we left off, it says, When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. I'm sure the urgency that is in his voice was a little different than what we read in verse 1 when he said, Here am I. He is about to do something that is unthinkable for any father to do. And he stops. He says, Here am I. He said, Do not lay a hand on the boy or do anything to him, for, for now I know that you fear God. So the angel of the Lord now knows that he fears God God knew it all along, but Abraham now knows as well. Abraham was willing to follow God to the ends of the earth, to a place he'd never been, to a place that he would show him, also to a place mentally no father should ever have to be, and he was able to do it. And God provided. In verse 13, he provided in a powerful way. 
It says, And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. I want you to think about this. He was prepared to offer his own son, and God made it possible for him not to have to go through that process. As he is offering this ram, can you imagine the thanksgiving? Can you imagine the worship? Thank you for not making it to where I had to offer my only son. I remember when my only begotten son at the time, God has blessed us with another, was born. We were, uh, it was that week um, that he was born. We went to, went to worship. And I met one lady that was at, you know, right at the door, caught, caught me at the door, and she said, the first thing she said, now do you understand what God went through when he offered his only son? I cried. I stood there and cried because I had just held my only son the day before. And I, and I didn't think about it. What God has provided for you and me is something that we, no, no man, no woman should ever have to face. And he didn't want even Abraham to face it. But Abraham was willing. And the reason I bring all this up is that the Lord will provide a place in that, that this, is the, this is the location where the Lord provided. Where Moriah is, is the same location as the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives is where Jesus went to pray, let this cup pass for me. Where the Lord was providing the lamb. But I want you to read verse 14 here. It says, so Abraham called the name of that place. It's no longer Moriah. And in the eyes of Abraham, it's not the Mount of Olives. It is the, the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. That's the name that it was given. The mount where the Lord shall provide. This is where Jesus was praying. But it's, it's, it's actually, it's not the direct location. I, I talked to my dad. He just came back from Israel and I asked him, I said, is Mount Moriah and the Mount of Olives, is it the same place? He said, no, it's about a th- thousand yards away. It's about a stone's throw with a sling away. This is the location where the Lord provided a test. Luke 22 and verse 39. Luke twenty two thirty nine, Where Jesus is being tested. It says, And he came out and went, as was his custom, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, Pray, that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. We spent some time last week discussing the, the, the angst, the, the urgency, the heavy weight that this cup was on his shoulders. And this is a test for him. Let this cup pass from me. He's saying, God, is there another way? And I want you to look at the screen. I don't really would say this, but I want you to think about what is he what is he praying for? He is praying for a ram in the thicket. And in a location very similar to this, as as Abraham is about to kill his only begotten son of him and Sarah. A ram was caught in a thicket. When he says, let this cup pass from me, is there another way? Is there a ram that you could provide so that I don't have to go to the cross? This is a test. But what was, Jesus, what was God providing with Jesus? The lamb. Not a lamb. The lamb. The end of verse 42 says... Remember, it's, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. He's saying, if there's no ram in the thicket, I'm, I'm going to follow your will. He obeyed. In fact, verse 45, 
Notice it says, And when he rose from prayer, and he's prayed three times to let this cup pass from him, he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said to them, Why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation while he was still speaking. So right after he's prayed the third time, he said to them, or while he was speaking, there came a crowd And the man called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? So Jesus didn't receive a ram in the thicket. And if you apply Matthew 25 to the dividing of the sheep and the goats, I submit that he had a band of people, and the leader of the goats, the leader of those who denied the Messiah, Judas, is leading the procession. With clubs and with torches, they are here to take the lamb that was to be slain. That immediately becomes the answer to the three prayers that Jesus prayed. How did he know that God was giving him this answer to his prayer. By hearing Judas approaching, he understood he was the lamb and that there was no other way. And we apply this in John 18 where it's, a, it's, re, it's related that when Peter cut off the ear of Malchus, Jesus said, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup that my father has given me? Remember the same cup he asked that passed from him? Jesus knew that the, the hour was come and that he would be slain the lamb to be slain for you and for me. And we get this from 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. It says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Abraham represents an exile. He had to leave his home. He had to go to a place that he'd never been. And if you think about it, we are sojourners in land that is not our home because we have another place. Another place that's been set for us. But I want to keep reading this before we go to John 14. It says, Knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold. It's not about the, the perishable things that we try to fill our bank accounts with, that we try to fill our house with. It's not about those things. It's not about the prosperity gospel. And anyone who would say it is only reading some verses to create a, a, a narrative to make us feel good. And it's not true. And the answer to that is found at the foot of the cross. Verse 19. We've not been ransomed with perishable things, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. Jesus was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. That is how he is the perfect without blot or blemish sacrifice. So that he could provide a place for us. Very popular passage for all of us is in John chapter 14. And Jesus says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and I'll take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. If you take John 13, 14, 15, and 16 in in mind, he's talking about going away because he's at the end of his ministry and he's about to go to the cross. And so often people have taken this, these three little verses, and they've said, Jesus is going to the Father's house, and he's working on the roof. And so as a carpenter, he's using his hammers and his nails, and he's actively working on that roof. He's getting it ready, and when he's done, he's ready, he'll come back and he'll take you to his home. 
The thing is, what he's saying is when he says, I go to prepare a place for you, he's saying, I'm going to the cross. Because he's prayed for this cup to pass from him. He, ha- he has understood that he's got to drink that cup now, and he goes without a word with Judas, and he's betrayed. He's put in the hands of sinful and lawless men, and instead of the nails that are being nailed into the shingles on that roof for the Father's house, the nails that we would refer to would be the nails that were nailed into his hands and his feet to prepare a place for you and me. He has prepared the place. The, pr- the place is done. It's ready for you and for me because of what he did at the cross. And I want you to think about the journey that it took for Jesus so that we would have a place. A three-day journey from the grave to the open tomb. A three-day journey from the grave to the open tomb. And that's got to be the most jagged and, and mountainous of anyone because he paid the ultimate price so that you and me don't have to pay that price. We don't have to die for our sin that we deserve to. We don't have to give our only begotten son for our own sin. God did that for you. And he did that for me. And it was a three-day journey. He was in the tomb for three days. And we are expected to take that journey in a very spiritual way but in a very arduous way. But Jesus says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Take my yoke upon me and, and learn from me. He says, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow after me. But before you can do that daily, there has to be a day where you die to yourself. In Romans chapter 6, we understand that that death to ourself is the definition of repentance, and that is a repentance that is ongoing. It's not a one and done. We repent, and what, do, what happens with a, a death? There needs to be a burial. That we die to ourselves in repentance, and we're buried with Christ in baptism. We understand in verse 6 that we rise to walk in newness of life. And that's not according to what, what we think. It's according to what God has said. So my question for you this morning is, have you died to yourself? Have you been buried and have you rose again? It doesn't have to be a three-day journey. But so often we miss that journey because there's teaching that says it doesn't matter. It's not important. But Jesus' teaching shows that it is. Are you willing to take that journey? It might start with coming forward while together we stand and while we sing.